someone has something really pressing they want to share, I want to give space for that. You can unmute and share to the group or, or put it in the chat. Um, and as well as keep these things in mind because you're they're going to come back up throughout today. We're going to talk about some of the other facilitators are going to bring up what were you surprised by and where how do you move forward? Does anybody want to share anything about that activity? Before we move on, if not, sharing is not required at this point, but keep it in mind, right? Keep it in mind, these wonderful prompts. Eastern Star shared something. I think we need to keep going and stay motivated. I wish we could, and I can't see the, the whole message. Because I wish we could get more people to join us. Ah, yes, that's always the thing, right? getting more people to join or buy in, but we keep going and we stay motivated. That's how we get that buy-in. So that's so important that we stay encouraged. We keep moving. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Awesome. I think next, what do we have? And more time. I love that, Victor. More time. We always need more time. I always feel like we need more time. Hey, Chandra. And Sorry yes. to interrupt. I just noticed that Mr. Sykes came off mute because I think he was maybe thinking about sharing what his team oh, had asked, but now I love he's on mute again. So <laughs> I was, but Victor shared it. So <laughs> is that what that's what it was, Mr. Sykes? More time? It was. It was. Yes, I love that. And and to name that, right? Because we always feel like we had we need more time. And mm -hmm. if we had more time, we would want more time. I love that. I love that. Um, next up, we're going to have Melissa, and she's going to be in the data corner talking to us about testing and data and what we do with it and what it means. So take it away, Melissa. There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. I, I get to go at the front end this time instead of like in an hour or hour and a half in when you guys are like data is the last word that you want to hear. So. Um, I'm going to scroll through my little um, headshots. I want to see everybody's like really energetic. I, I need your energy today. I borrowed all of my energy from today, yesterday, and I, I need I need some energy from y'all today. OK. Um, OK, but it is. I, I, I'm excited. This is like my favorite tool that we're going to share today. So. Um, yeah, I even made this cool um, little slide. I'm the least creative. Um, PowerPoint slide maker. So this was this. I, I need I need some credit for this one. Like I need some snaps maybe. But this is um, the Friends episode, the one where they got a really cool tool. I've given you a lot of cool tools. This one's my favorite. So I've been I've been saving my favorite. Um, and I think it's perfect for this point in the journey because if 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 you are like a lot of the teams that I've been talking to. Um, this is kind of the, this is the point where things start to go one of two ways. They either, you know, you, you press through, like when you're feeling like I don't have enough time, this is starting to feel really burdensome. It's feeling like a lot of extra steps and stuff I don't have time for. And things either start to fall off and eventually die a slow death or they take off and you start learning really, really deeply. And that re-motivates you, reinvigorates you and this is the turning point where you either start, you take the path towards transformational change or you take the path down, you know, something we tried really, really hard on. And so I hope that today, everything that you get out of it and the reflection and the time that you have together will reinvigorate you. And hopefully here is a practical, tangible tool to get you there. Um, next slide, please. Okay, has anyone, show of hands, heard of the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule? They are one and the same. So yeah, 80-20 probably is a little bit more familiar, but the, uh, the idea, the principle was um, established, created by an Italian guy way back in the day, and his name was Vilfredo Pareto. And so that might just help you remember um, the name of the, the, the chart because um, 
it takes a few times saying it before it, it um, rolls off the tongue. But the whole idea is that if you can look at the data and truly understand your system, your process, what you're working on, that 20% of your effort will get you 80% of your results and vice versa. So nobody wants to be spending 80% of their effort unless you're, you know, unless you're trying to get to that last, like from 95 to 100%, right? So um, let's, let's work harder or work smarter, not harder is, is basically the 80-20 rule. And so the next slide is a very simple example. So this is there, you know, we've all, we all order pizza. We've all had the pizza come late, especially if it's Friday night, because nobody wants to cook. Everybody's ordering pizza. And so um, this is an example of a pizza delivery um, operation where they were having a whole lot of problems going on. They were getting complaints after complaint after complaint. And they had so many problems. They had no idea where to start. Um, so what they did was they looked at their data for one week and they tracked every um, failure, every failed delivery, anything that went wrong, they tracked it on a piece of paper with a tally mark. And so the kind of the categories of things that came up were the categories that you see at the bottom. Driver got lost, wrong address, they got the wrong order, they got stuck in traffic, wasn't enough drivers, they were slammed, or there was like a really complex, intricate order and we just, we didn't get it right because it was so complicated. Well, you know, if you look at these, they're really different. And what you would be testing, like the things you might put in place to try to fix these are really, really different. If you, um, you could put all kinds of training and, and processes and standardization in place to try to make sure that no comp, that every order was absolutely correct. And you could put a lot of time and effort into that. But in reality, a lot of people are basically ordering pepperoni pizzas, cheese pizzas. You know, there aren't a lot of like half mushroom and half anchovy with, you know, a Venn diagram of like uh, green peppers across, a, a, you know, two quarters. That's pretty rare. Um, and so what this data told them was where to focus and where to start. Um, or, you know, if you're working on a lot of these things, it's kind of like the point that you guys are in in this process. If you're feeling pulled in multiple directions, or maybe you've got folks that think the problem is not enough drivers, you know, or they think whatever that kind of correlates for you, um, you just go look at the data and the data tells you what to do and you takes the emotion out of it. It takes the kind of the team dynamics out of it. It's like, well, this is just kind of what, what the data is telling us. Um, so just a really simple basic answer or uh, uh, example of how this tool can help you. And the red line that you see across the top, that tells you at which category you finally get to your 80%. So you need to focus on all of the barriers until you get to 80%. So, um, you know, if, if uh, there was, there was less in one of these categories, we might have to address four of the categories. But in this case, they only have to address three. Okay, so very simple example. Now I'm gonna give a practical example, and then I'm gonna tell a little bit of a more interesting story. Um, but as I'm kind of talking through these, I want you guys to be writing down and kind of thinking about some thoughts about what type of Pareto chart or charts because there's multiple ways to slice and dice data to help you use it. What are some things that you might want to look at on a Pareto chart relative to what you guys are working on with your project? So just write some things down and that'll tee you up for the reflection that's coming up in a little bit. Okay, so just three more bullet points. A Pareto chart is a chart that arra arranges these categories in, in descending order. So you're looking at the most important thing on the left all the way over to the least important. And like I said, it breaks it down into these smaller, you know, it, it breaks the elephant apart so you can truly eat it one bite at a time. And then the last thing to remember is that it separates the vital few from the trivial many. So we only, let's, let's just try to figure out what the vital few are and not worry about the rest yet because we're not, we're just not there yet. So one more practical example. Okay, so this is from a team I was working with um, 
that is a uh, youth um, homeless shelter. And ultimately they were, their global aim, right? Like, so these, they should look familiar. These are, this is from their key driver diagram. Ultimately, they were trying to provide, you know, youth client centric services that supported the, uh, the youth and their families in their path to a safe and healthy life. So super important work that they do. And the team that I was working with um, was in charge of, of their data and analytics, which is a huge piece of reporting, of grant writing, of, of all of it. It might not seem like the, um, I don't know, the most exciting part of, of that work, but it's super important. And what they were realizing after doing some auditing was that <clears throat> only 64% of their records were like complete and compliant and correct, which is not a great rate, especially when you're trying to apply for, for grants and funding. Um, and so they knew they had to improve that, but they had no idea where to start. Like it's a big organization. There's so much data. There's so many forms. There's multiple databases. So they were like, where the heck do we start? So I kind of wanted to pause here and kind of hopefully some juices, um, some ideas are flowing. Uh, but if you are working at this uh, youth shelter and you've got this data problem, this database problem, what questions would you ask? I mean, you don't have to like, it doesn't have to be phrased perfectly, but like, what do you want to know? What do you want to dig into to better understand what's going on with why this data is not being in, put in complete in completely incorrectly? And I'm very patient, so I'll wait for somebody to chime in. How is the data collected? Like, are there several different forms they're getting it from? Um, who's doing the collection? Yep, those are both ways that they wanted to look at it. Anybody think of anything else? Are, is it all, are, are the completion rates of all client records really low or is it, or is it only certain client records mm -hmm. that we need to focus? Yeah, like how could you um, disaggregate clients and look at it by client type? Um, yeah, those are a great idea. Um, oh, and I see a comment. Tara says, what led to the completion rates? Yeah, so what was going so, right? Right, I would just wanna know, yeah, when it, when they were completing, what were some of the things that led to the 64%? Sure. So those are those are all great. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I was going to show one of the ways that they, the, the first way that they looked at it. Um, and I think it was Mary that said, um, what, what were the types of forms that were the most incomplete? So these were the different types of forms that they use. Um, there's seven of them across the bottom. Um, and can you imagine if they had like spent a whole lot of time or effort on assessment, daily notes, whatever CIRs or discharge? I mean, but going into this, they, they had no idea where the errors really were. They just knew we're getting, we're getting dinged for this lack of compliance. So first they looked at what form is it? And there's a clear winner, right? So they knew where to start. Um, and they had to figure out what was going on with their admission forms. Is something wrong with the form? Is, you know, what, 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 why is it that we have no errors in these last four and, you know, admission PSN and CCP are um, dragging us down. So they looked a little bit farther. On the next slide, you can see kind of like a, a drill down almost. If you kind of like think about this as like another layer that they drilled down and they did another Pareto. And these were all of the items on the admission form. So within the admission form, what are we missing the most? And let's like really try to start there so that we're not just, you know, there's probably 20 items on here, I guess. Let's figure out where we need to focus if there's some training um, that we need to provide. Um, and so it was the youth personal property inventory that was often the, um, that was incomplete and left blank which when they realized that they felt um, a huge sense of urgency because 
that's probably the most important field on that entire form to their youth clients. That if they came in with something in their possession and it wasn't recorded and then there was no record of that or you know they had kind of trouble verifying that, that's, that's a really um, uncomfortable you know, damaging, you know, thing to, to occur with a client that needs to trust you. Um, so it, it was alarming, but it also told them exactly where they needed to start their focus. And so they immediately started there and, um, training their staff on, um, really making sure how, like that, that, that they were filling out outright, that that wasn't being skipped. If it was a, a middle of the night, um, admission or something like that. Um, so just checkpoint here to see if that resonates, if you can see how doing this kind of look or slicing some of your data that you, you that's relevant to your project, can you see how this might maybe give you some direction if you're feeling pulled or even just not sure where to go next? Maybe just a, a thumbs up or a thumb sideways or down if 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 it feels off base or it doesn't resonate. I got okay. Marcus got a thumbs up. Summer. All right. Okay. So how am I doing on time, Courtney? Pretty good. About five to seven more minutes. Okay. I've got one more story that um, I would like to get through. And this is the first time I have ever told this story because um, usually when we deliver this story or tell this story, um, a colleague of mine that, that led this improvement effort tells the story um, and I click through the slides for her. But, um, and so for the last five years, she has told the story, but I lost her this summer um, to cancer. And so this is the first time I have done this content without her. So I'm sharing that because if I get oddly, if my voice quivers or I go off trail off track, um, I would ask that you have some grace and understand that that is where I am coming from today. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So backstory. So um, Cheryl, my friend um, that should be telling this story, uh, was uh, back in 2015, she was the assistant superintendent um, of Cincinnati Public Schools. And we had been working with her on training up um, some of her staff and continuous improvement using some of these tools, like just using more data, more real-time data. Um, it also happened to be kind of like a perfect storm because at that same time, Ohio changed the um, standardized test. It was kind of, you know, all the common core stuff coming in. And they went from the Ohio standardized test to the air test, which was the common core designated test. And Cincinnati Public had, had been rocking the OST. They were like around 90% in most of their schools for third graders reading proficiently, <clears throat> which was really important because Ohio was also passing one of those third grade reading guarantees. I don't know if North Carolina has one of those, but um, you know, that legislation that we're uh, put in place in a lot of states where if you're not reading uh, proficiently by third grade, then you get held back. Anyway, so they changed the test, but um, that first picture, sorry, I was dragging a little bit. Um, that first picture is how they felt going into the test, right? Cause they're like, we've got this, we've been nailing these standardized tests forever. Well, after the air test, they actually felt like this. Um, and their proficiency rates dropped to about an average of 46% from between 80 and 90 at most of their um, about 35 elementary schools. So huge, huge um, drop in data, you know, big, important accountability measure. Like, so they had to dig into what happened and why. <clears throat> so they... Um, do some deep interviews, they look at the data and ultimately do a Pareto to figure out what in the heck are we missing? So they did the Pareto on the missed points um, for, for all students. And these are, the count isn't, isn't right. I mean, these are like hundreds of, of missed, hundreds and thousands of missed points. Um, so that might actually be like in a ratio of a thousand, but they, 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 uh, 
looked at all the data, they figured out where they'd missed all the points, and they realized that just a, it was overwhelmingly, I mean, what 90% of them were in writing. Hmm. So they definitely had to address the other domains, right? You can't, you're not going to ignore that, but it was pretty obvious where they needed to start, but that was not where they were going to start. Um, so focusing on the vital few or that vital one, if you'll click to the next slide, Courtney, um, the teacher started talking and trying different things. And so the first thing they tried was, um, okay, so this test is now computerized. Um, the kids aren't used to typing, they're running out of time. They're, they're just leaving, you know, points on the board. So let's, let's give them a graphic organizer. So they were able to choose, um, I mean, I'm sure Alyssa or Summer could, or, or any of the educators on here could give a rundown of some, some good graphic organizers, but the students were taught a few of them and then they could pick one that, that worked best for them. You know, seems like the way we do things, right? Personalize, meet people where they are, let them choose what works for them. Um, usually a great approach, uh, but they, so they kept doing that. And what they learned was the students that were using post-its as a graphic organizer were doing better. They had them kind of in front of them. They were able to move them around. So they thought, okay, well, let's see if there's something with this post-it thing. So the second little bit, they, um, the three, it was three teachers at the time. They all start using the post-its. They have the same positive results. It keeps improving. Then they start to notice, oh, these kids are using the same color post-its for the, the um, introduction and the conclusion because that's, a, you know, they, they're supposed to talk about the prompt and then they're using different colors for the, the reasoning and the, and the referring back to the pack passage. So, um, oh, and then they also started with the sentence starters. They gave them the sentence starters. So then the kids knew, okay, I, on this post-it I have my reason, on this one I have my refer back to the text and on this one I have in conclusion. Um, keep getting more positive results. And then ultimately they kind of nailed it when they realized, oh, what if we had post-its that the color was um, correlated or um, started with the same letter as the, 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 that part of the, the essay. So purple became prompt, red became reasoning and blue became back to the passage. So, I mean, these were really little bets with three teachers just on a weekly basis. Like the first week they tried the first one, the second week they tried the second one and so on. And they just kept getting the same positive results. So ultimately they had really high confidence that this was working. This, this is a, a strategy that is working for a majority of our students and our scores are shooting up. Um, and so on the next slide, I wanted to share you know, when you get to a point that you have learned deeply, you have kind of identified that thing that is working, you have a prototype, then you start to think about how to spread it. So they were testing on a really small scale, which for a district of 35,000 kids and, you know, 400 teachers, three teachers is a really small scale. Um, and that's what they started with. And then after that fourth little bet, when they started to um, have it kind of nailed down with the sentence starters and then the colors, they scaled to 10 teachers and they started, they saw the same positive results. So then they went to 30, but that's still pretty small scale. And it was kind of at that point that they had, you know, a, a, a moment of, okay, is, is, are we ready to take this big? Because if it goes, if we, if we scale it up to a whole grade level and it bombs anywhere, you know, it's, it's, it's dead in the water. And so let's, let's make sure. So then they went to small scale, which was about 80 teachers. And I think those were in like a smaller number of schools. They didn't do it. Um, all schools, you know, second or third grade, um, until they got to their large scale test, which was, um, all second and third graders, third grade teachers. It was over 200 teachers and they still got the same positive results. So ultimately then they began to implement um, and, and start working through a change management process, which you'll hear more about later. But I just thought this might be a good visual to show you how long it takes, how long it should take before you start implementing something. I mean, you need to, there needs to be a really low risk of um, 
a failure by the time that you are implementing. And ultimately in one year, Cincinnati Public Schools, um, it took them a year to scale this up um, and spread. But um, after they did the, their point, the proficiency jumped 30% in the first year. Wow. So any, any questions or reactions, reflections? Do you guys think this tool is as cool as I do or am I just a huge data nerd? <laughs> Come on, give me something, guys. I made it through that without crying. It would have been totally okay if you did cry, honestly. Um, I did have a question and maybe you answered this and it just didn't stick. But so the column that says resistant, mm. um, those teachers, I mean, that very small scale test say more about why that's labeled as resistant because obviously those three teachers weren't resistant no and 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 i would i actually i combined two slides on this one to try to make the point um so it wasn't that those teachers were resistant i was just kind of trying to give a scale of of how that was those three teachers they initiated it right so that's a really good good point and thank you for bringing that up um your, your very smallest scale tests, those are probably not gonna be resistant at all. I guess it's more in terms of thinking about the system being resistant to this change. And at that point, your system is not very res resistant because those people are driving it and they're totally bought in. Thank you, Melissa. I, I was just, yeah. So yeah. it could, be, could potentially be another descriptive language also instead of resistant, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I like the tool. I like how you showed the process can take some time. It validates, yeah, validates your experience. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have everything figured out. That's for sure. Okay, well, thank you all for that. And thank you for your grace. And I knew this was a safe place to cry. And that's why I was so glad that I could do it here first. Um, hey, so with Melissa, that, can I just jump in real quick? Yes, please. I just wanted to thank you for using that example because you know, for a district or a, an organization that size to, for you to be able to demonstrate them trusting this process over so much time and so many iterations of the test, I think it really bodes well for us in smaller organizations that we can also take an innovative approach, right? Like, you don't, like they had everything going against them to be that big and to be responsible for so many kids. There's so many reasons not to try something new and yet they did it. So it gives me hope that you know we can be innovative um, and, and get to that cutting edge and do cool things. So thank you for sharing that example. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think it's another, it's just a reminder that 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 data talks and nobody, even the most bureaucratic district, which trust me that one was, um, can argue with results. And so if you get results, like that's all you got to do. And so sometimes you got to start slow to go fast. All right, here you go, Emily. All right, guys, how cool is that tool? Yeah. So you all have been moving through little besting, little bets, I guess little besting a little too. Um, you've been moving through little bets, you've been learning about these tools, and we heard in the beginning that this can feel a little overwhelming and you've got only so much time. So we're gonna take a pause, we're gonna reflect a little bit. This is the process we're gonna move through. So you just heard a lot of information, we're gonna take a breath, we're going to reflect a little bit on where we're at and where we're going, celebrate some wins. That way we can move forward into action. So when we feel overwhelmed, sometimes we just need to take a breath, uh, figure out what's going on. That way we can move forward. So everybody good with doing some reflecting so that we can move to action? I'd like to see thumbs up across the screen. You can raise just one thumb. I got a lot of twos. Perfect. All right, let's keep moving. So this is the template that you all completed last session. Um, so just a reminder that this is where we've been at. We are moving toward the Pareto. This is all of the information that you have. So you've laid out a process for testing. You have a lot of information. Um, you've dug in, you have these options. So just reminding you where you have been. Um, might be a good time to figure out where this template is for you if you need to pull it up. 
So thinking about that activity that we did last week, we are gonna send you all into breakouts and you are gonna think about these four questions, thinking about that process for testing template that you worked on last time and any notes you took during the measurement section that you just listened to. So that's what you kind of need either in front of you or just in your brain, however you work. I know I need to look at things. So if you need to pull up that template from last time, the process for testing, do so now. And then any notes or questions you have from the measurement section that you just heard, get those in front of you. So give everybody like 30 seconds just to move through that. If you're somebody who needs things in front of you, I know I am. I'm counting to 30 really slowly in my head. Okay, if you're pulling those up, continue to do so. So looking at those templates and those notes, here are the questions we're gonna answer in breakouts. First, what feels scary for you about testing little bets? It is totally okay for this to feel scary. Let's name it. What feels scary about it? And that's it. We're not judging those feelings, we're just naming them. Then what are the barriers that exist for reaching your goal? These can be barriers that exist in the real context of your challenge. Like I physically cannot do this part of my little bet testing, or it's really hard to reach these people, or they can be psychological barriers. So this is scary and that's a barrier, or I don't know how I can balance the time of testing these little bets and running a program. With questions one and two, we're just naming these things outright and we're not judging anything that comes from this reflection. Then number three, hopefully inspired by the story Melissa just told, or just your process in general, we are gonna share a win that you've observed during the testing process. This can be really big, it can be really tiny. So any win that you have found during the testing process, we're gonna name those as well. And then thinking about the barriers that your team has named, how can we clear those barriers? So let's just go through them one by one, think about how you can clear them. Some might have a really easy clear, right? Like. I'm lacking time. I've got to just schedule these 30 minutes on my calendar to be able to do this. Or this feels really scary, but I am going to take one step at a time to do something brave. Or um, I need to just get connected with this person. I haven't been connected with them. That's been the barrier. Here's the things I'm going to do to get connected. So these four questions, what feels scary? What are the barriers? What's a win? And how do we clear those barriers that our whole team has named? Everybody good with those? Okay, be really honest in these. Again, there's no judgment in any reflection. Um, it's just about putting it all out there. Yep, thanks, Emily. And just to kind of circle up on what she said, we're gonna open breakout rooms here in a second for all teams, same as the connection activity. You'll just self-join your specific breakout. Um, so coaches, if you can, um, Vichy's gonna drop in the chat for us the template they'll be using for this activity. Um, so go ahead and make your team's a team a copy, name it, so you have that ready to place in your team deliverables folder. In your breakouts with your team, work to answer those four questions that Emily generated for us. And then together, discuss how testing has gone and where you want to focus your efforts may become in the coming weeks. Um, in addition to you working alongside your coaches in breakout rooms with your teams, you will have an additional coach um, jump into those spaces with you um, to just add additional coaching and additional support as you kind of move through some of the feelings around the barrier, some of the wins you've um, experienced so far in the testing process. So there'll be a few extra faces in your team spaces. So just wanted to name that as well, because we want to give you guys some, um, some extra support um, in session. Okay. There are no questions. I'll go ahead and open our breakouts. Again, you just self-select those breakouts. You just find your team's name and join that room. The rooms are open. We'll have about 30 minutes here for this activity. So around um, uh, 2.25, we'll come back and um, 
I can't wait to see what you guys come up with and what you reflect on. So if you have any questions, hang back in the main room. If you need support with adding yourself to a room, we're here to help you with that as well. And go forth and be great. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. So, uh, Courtney, hi. Okay, so they're coming back.